I'm delighted to be hosting this special Inside HR uh, breakfast session on corporate ethics. And um, it's great to see such a, a big turnout, so thank you all for coming. Can I just ask who are the first timers who's never been to one of these events before? Okay, the vast majority. Well, I hope that we, um, we inspire you to come to some more events next year. Um, and I'll be telling you about the next one shortly. So, this event is happening today thanks to Ian Muir. Hi, Ian. <laughs> um, so, just a little bit about Ian. Um, I've known Ian for getting on for 10 years now, I think it must be, uh, mainly as a customer uh, for my transition services. Um, and Ian has been great to work with. Um, he makes it very easy. He's very open, he's very collaborative. And you always know where you are with Ian because he's a very values-driven guy, so you don't get any surprises, if you like. Except that, there is one thing that did surprise me about Ian. I'm just thinking this event's about ethics, um, which I'll share with you. Um, don't worry about him, he's, he's fine. He won't, he won't mind this. Um, which is that I've got evidence that he, was, uh, he is in the process um, of copying a very famous painting and passing it off as an original. <laughs> very good. There is more to Ian than meets the eye. Now, Ian, when he starts his presentation, will present his sort of corporate persona, you know, the, the serious stuff. But um, as I said, there's a lot more to him than meets the eye. Uh, when I first knew him, he used to be the international HR director for cable and wireless um, and did lots and lots of traveling. And, you know, an idea of the kind of guy Ian is, um, you, you get that when you realize what he did with his traveling time. So while he was traveling, what he actually did was write that terrific book. That book, um, The Book of Inner Strength, um, is a book that's been used by literally hundreds and hundreds of my clients. Um, and it's been very, very helpful for them to lift their spirits when needed, to help boost their creative juices when they're a bit blocked, but more than anything, to um, flip people's mindset into a much more positive way of thinking. So thank you very much for writing that book. And I, I gather the second edition is out. is out now, available from all leading bookshops <laughs> or online at some <coughs> unbelievable knockdown discount. <laughs> a very good buy. So, um, OK, uh, without further ado, um, Let's just move, move into the event itself. Uh, but I'm just going to squeeze in a very, very quick advertisement for the next session, which is happening on the 21st of January, uh, entitled Digital Glue, Engaging and Leading in a Fragmented World of Work, um, delivered by Paul Miller, who is uh, excellent at this stuff. And I think you'll find it a very provocative and um, stimulating session if you can make it. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Ian. So welcome everybody, great to see so many people and I think it just shows how important this topic is and also how current and topical. It, it seems that with every day that passes we hear of a new ethical issue or even a, a, need, a kind of ethical scandal hitting the media. This event is oversubscribed and I think what that shows is that it's a very important topic for all of us in this room. Now. Some commentators say that the tone from the top is kind of obvious and business ethics are kind of a non-event because it's, it's there in black and white, you do the right thing. But my observation is that ethical issues rarely present themselves in black and white. And frequently, they present ethical dilemmas which make it quite hard. Similarly, when you think about due diligence and collecting enough information about something, very often things emerge over a period of time. And I've never yet met a manager who felt that they fired somebody too soon. They've always said that by the time they reached the decision, uh, there had been a kind of long series of pointers and indicators that built a picture, and they wished they had acted sooner. So I'd like to ask a couple of ethical questions. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to call out the answers. So, but you might like to just think about these for yourself. Here goes. 
You're the only passenger in a car. The driver causes an accident. You're the only witness. Your statement to the police, your testimony, can get the driver prosecuted and convicted or let off the hook. Do you testify against the driver? Do you testify against the driver if he is a minicab driver who you believe to be unlicensed? Do you testify against the driver if she is your boss? Do you testify against the driver if he is a neighbour with whom you've been having a dispute and you are about to ask a huge favour? Hmm. Do you testify against the driver if she is your 17-year-old daughter whose total cost of motoring is paid for by you? So, very often ethical issues are kind of not so black and white. It's more about, hmm, well, maybe, hmm. And so to the second question. It's time to elect a new world leader. You have the casting vote. Let's review some information about the leading candidates. The first candidate associates with dodgy politicians, consults astrologers, has got quite a drinking problem and has had two extramarital affairs. The second candidate has been ejected from office twice, has a problem getting out of bed because this person also has a pretty severe drinking problem, suffers from depression. Hmm. Third candidate appears to lead a, a slightly more wholesome lifestyle, pretty much vegetarian, doesn't really drink, has the occasional beer, hmm. no extramarital affairs, a decorated war hero. Final candidate, revered in his country, famous, a great philanthropist, <coughs> no doubt about it, has raised countless millions for really deserving causes. Who do you vote for? So a few smiles around the room, and you're probably thinking, hmm, interesting. And some of you are probably saying, well, OK, so you said here's some information about the leading candidates. Let me rephrase that. Here is some information about the leading candidates. And perhaps it's a question about how much information is enough information and when do we stop digging? What about the due diligence? Because very often when you have problem people, and this is what came out of the research, people say that the signs were there but nobody had the guts or the bravery to do something about it. So have you worked out who the candidates are? for your casting vote? No. OK, so first candidate, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Second candidate, Winston Churchill. Third candidate, Adolf Hitler. Fourth candidate, Jimmy Savile. <laughs> Good. So <clears throat> a few words about me. 32 years in corporate life member of the executive committee of a FTSE 150 global engineering company, um, a few other things like Group HR director. I've done quite a lot of work on top team development. I've done some work on board evaluation, both inside uh, a large PLC and also outside as an independent consultant. And having now left corporate life, um, enjoying myself, really doing three things, non-exec, independent consulting or advisory, and working with business schools. And it's through my association with Ashridge Business School that I conducted this research project on the tone from the top. And so we, I think we're going to email copies round to everybody. And it's been a fascinating journey interviewing chairmen across a whole range of sectors. Now, something's not right. And almost a day doesn't go by without some new kind of scandal. And let me say, I am not going to poke fun at any of these organisations listed here. Uh, not least because we've got people in this room who work for these companies, want to work for these companies, or have worked for some of these companies. This is really an exercise in best practice. However, 
such is the kind of turmoil in the media that I could have put a lot more organisations onto this slide, only it wasn't big enough. So, um, would anybody from the floor like to just pick one and explain why you think it's on the slide, and perhaps we'll have a second submission in terms of if anybody doesn't know why a company is on the slide, perhaps you'd like to ask, because if you don't know, at least <laughs> half a dozen other people may not know. Stafford Hospital. <coughs> so, you're going to tell us about Stafford Hospital? Well, we, I think we all know about Stafford Hospital, but I know the characters involved. You know the characters involved? Okay. Um, including the chief executive of the NHS, who should never have had the job in the first place. Mm -hmm. And it was on his watch that when he was at the Strategic Health Authority that all this happened. And it's a demonstration of not knowing what's going on at the coalface. And having been an NAD of an NHS trust, I know only too well how little people know what goes on at the coalface, even inside one little hospital. Mm. And I think, you know, the old Tom Peters mantra of management by walking about seems to have disappeared out of, out of business society, by and large, in these places. Because you only have to walk around, you see, that doesn't look quite right. Mm. And away you go. Thank you very much, Michael. Would anyone like to ask why one particular organisation is on the list? Zurich. Zurich, yes. Well, if you believe the media, uh, it's quite an extraordinary story, but apparently, it is alleged, the CFO committed suicide and left a note. And in the note, he was somewhat critical <coughs> of the chairman's management style. Quite a sad story. EY, um, hauled in front of a parliamentary select committee uh, on how and why they had advised various organisations on minimising corporation tax. What about DFS? DFS, yes. Yeah, six furniture retailers being investigated uh, on account of false discounting, where, you know, they have these wonderful advertisements, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80% off. Um, it is alleged nobody actually pays the so-called full price. Yeah. Uh, RSA. I'm sorry, again? RSA. Um, yes, um, RSA Insurance uh, two weeks ago revealed a £70 million black hole in their accounts, uh, largely attributed to their Irish subsidiary, and they're still looking for the money. Is GSK clinical trials? GSK, um, that's there because of the investigation in China on alleged bribery and corruption. Although it should be said that actually eight companies in China are being investigated for bribery and corruption in the pharmaceutical sector, and two of them are Chinese companies. So as you can see, we've got quite a lot of organizations on there, um, and let's move on. I interviewed the chairman of these organisations. And what's interesting is that you'll see at least a couple on this list who actually appeared on the previous list. And actually, I, I take my hat off to those chairmen because it would have been the easiest thing in the world for them to say, look at him, spot of bother, really sorry, can't talk to you today. But actually, they said the complete opposite, which is it's precisely because we have a spot of bother that we really want to talk to you and explain why ethical leadership, behavioural leadership, business ethics really, really matter to us and to our companies, so we want to participate. And I had a fantastic conversations. So Chris Gent at uh, Glaxo uh, was very, very helpful indeed. I also spoke to senior people at the ABI, uh, responsible for what, between a third and a half of all the investments on the London Stock Exchange, uh, the Institute of Business Ethics, and also one of the leading search companies uh, headhunting people into kind of FTSE top 50 organisations. So it was a very broad spread of sectors, engineering, pharmaceuticals, financial services, hospitality, construction. The combined market capitalisation of these organisations is more than a quarter of a trillion pounds. So I like to think it's fairly representative of... UK PLC. So what were their observations? What do we talk about? Well, first of all, 
everyone agreed that it all starts with a strong professional ethical chair. If you haven't got that, you're, you're heading for difficulty. That then enables the person chairing the business to build a strong, respected board, which by virtue of that is likely to get much more traction with the management of, of the wider organisation. Then we talked about strong governance, not just process and box ticking, but the way in which the governance processes work, the behaviours around are governance activities welcomed or reviled? Are people cooperative and collaborative or kind of, hmm, that's a bit awkward. We also said that boards need to watch out for signs of dysfunctionality. And that's a topic I'd like to, re to return to a little bit later on. And then what we said is the chair runs the board, the CEO runs the company. And so the person chairing the company is responsible for the tone at the top, and then the CEO takes that and is responsible for the tone from the top as it gets promulgated all the way down and through and across the organisation. And I guess the final point is you just can't rely on process alone. All these companies that had scandals had excellent governance processes and really good people. But somehow it turned into a bit of an administrative exercise that didn't pick up on certain signals or issues. So what then are the levers of the tone from the top that we can control to influence outcomes? Well, you'll see here that we've got a whole range of process issues such as code of conduct, whistleblowing, um, external audits and so on. But there are also some interesting behavioural things around values, training, behaviour, signalling and so on. Um, the signals that the board sends to the organisation through its actions, through its decisions, through its conversations, um, yeah, how it works. How it, it's, it's the how more than the what. I then pieced together some of these and what the chairman was saying was that it all comes back to ethics and the extent to which ethics govern the work of the board and how it does it. And so quality of leadership clarity regarding who you are, what you are, why you are what you are. Whistleblowing, for example, is it uh, lost in an administrative nightmare of trivia or does it really elicit things that are truly troubling people at work? Is there a commitment to continuous improvement? What of the quality of the relationships that build into the network of conversations that become the culture of the organisation? And then wider things, such as the employee survey. Is that an HR administrative process, or is it a boardroom agenda item uh, evoking huge interest, particularly from the non-execs? What of assurance processes? Are the non-executives close to the business? To your point, Michael, do they really know what's going on at the coal face? Uh, do they have a relationship with managers, but without treading on the toes of the CEO? So I said I'd say something about dysfunctional boards. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these points, but if I just pick on a couple, um, if it's the wrong environment where there is inadequate or insufficient challenge and support, that's problematical. If boards are always unprepared and often surprised, that's also problematical. So my suggestion is that for any senior team, not necessarily just a board, but any senior team that's showing kind of two or more of these, the chances are one needs to do something about it. But interestingly, most of these are behavioural matters rather than process matters. And that took me into values in the discussion with all of these chairmen. And they were pretty clear that values are very, very important because they prescribe the behaviour and what I call the behavioural leadership that sends these signals down into the organisation. And values are helpful for situations where there are no rules. And so if people need guidance where you don't have a rule book for everything, if they think about values, mm, what would my boss do? What would my boss's boss do? That's helpful. 
And values help people to resolve issues where there is ambiguity. So if you're working in a call center and one of your values is integrity and the customer wants a refund, maybe if they've got a good case, you don't need to look it up in the rule book because the high integrity thing to do is to give a refund. But values also instill a sense of moral backbone, which I think is very, very important on facing up to ethical difficulties. And that helps secure the identity of the organization and helps it work its assurance processes. So that collectively gives a sense of distinctiveness. And I think that's important because a huge proportion of corporate value uh, comes from intangible assets such as reputation, the brand, the brand promise. Uh, if you take Serco, for example, they said that they had overcharged the government while transporting prisoners. Their share price fell 17% in two hours and ended the day, I think, 14% down. So hundreds of millions of pounds wiped out uh, in a couple of hours. So the research into the tone from the top uh, enables us to think about mitigating three areas of risk. And so I'm calling these bad apples, foolish apples, and tempted apples. Bad apples, people whose ethical compass is distorted or defective, or some might say they're just bad people. Foolish apples are people who do not act with malice aforethought, but they're people who kind of don't think sufficiently or haven't been trained, or they're fitting in with what they think is the norm, and then they go on and do something that actually really isn't very advisable. And then tempted apples are people that, frankly, give in to temptation uh, because they're either under pressure or they're kind of lured into doing something or tempted because of uh, something that entices them.